It's Wednesday, December 21st, 2016. It's time for Worth Point Chats with Harry Rinker. I'm Greg Watkins, the editor of Worth Point. Hey, Harry, how are you doing tonight? Well, I'm, I'm doing very well. I, I'm actually, you know, I, I think I told you the other week, I'm a Christmas Scrooge. I'm so sick yeah. of Christmas, I can't stand it. But no. But other than that, let me wish you at least a happy holidays. Now, you notice how politically correct that is? That's right. Well, right. You know, I, I grew up Lutheran, and you know, you always want to say to people, Merry Christmas. And then you realize, well, maybe it's not, A, it may not be merry for them, depending on how you inter how things are going. But the second of all, it may be politically incorrect to say that to a Turk, you know, you want to go up to someone who's a Muslim and say, Merry Christmas. That's a little strange. Uh, so now you have to be politically correct and say, Happy Holiday. And that covers holiday, it all. Yes. But or, it doesn't really cover, cover, cover it. They well, it does. It does. I mean, no, they, no, they didn't make Happy Holiday movies. Come on. Uh and, and you know what? We don't collect happy holiday Santas either. You know, when we this talk about Christmas collectibles, man, it's, <laughs> it's Christmas. And it's not just it's not just secular Christmas either. I mean, we talk about the Christmas crutches, crutches and all the rest of the religious symbolism of the season, too. So anyway, happy whatever you want to make it be. You know, I just hope everybody is going to have a good, safe holiday and, and uh, take some time and Tone down a little bit. In fact, we're going to take some time. We're not going to do the show next week, but that's all right. That, uh, yeah, right. We're going to we're going to we're going to we'll back in 2017 or right in the year with a little bit of uh, rest and relaxation. Well, we are, we are, and and you know, besides that, this was a five week month, so we're supposed to do four shows a month. So theoretically, we're not violating any of the rules. That's right. 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 But but here it is. It's it's time. I'm not going to ask you about New Year's resolutions because I found that they're a waste of time. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, I, 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 I've never in all the thirty years I've written Rinker on Collectibles, I've never written a Rinker on Collectibles New Year's resolution column because I'm not dumb. Because I know the minute you have a checklist to judge things by, it ain't going to work. No, no, and I, right? I've never, never hit any of those targets. So, right, not even but, worth. But, but it is, it is, as they say in the season, a time for reflection, and. You start to think back, well, you know, between late December of 2015 and now late December 2016, what changes? What's going on in the trade? You know, if you had to pick a couple of things, what 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 goes on in the trade? Now, it, it, it's difficult to have this kind of conversation because the trade doesn't change. Somebody doesn't flick a switch and we change. Right. I mean, these gradual changes, you know, goes on for decades sometimes, Right. Right. Okay, we've lost you. I, oh, I, oh, you're putting up the Harry the Guru sign. You think I'm going to be Guru? I, I, I sensed the, I sensed a, uh, a, sensed a, a sensed a Guru Harry at the top of the mountain moment here, right? That's right. That's right. Well, it could be a top of the moment uh, moment because the truth of the matter is that that if you stop and think about it, though, you know, you know, there's old that that that, that old Christmas holiday song. Huh? Have you seen what I've seen? And the answer is, have you seen what I've seen? Because what happens in the antiques and collectibles trade is most people don't see what's going on in the trade as a whole. They're so focused on their own specialized collecting category that they don't see the, the big trends. I mean, that's, in a way, Rinker on Collectibles, which is now, cel will celebrate its 30th anniversary column, column 1,560, on Monday, December The 19th, it's already passed. Uh, ah. The column is three years old. Uh, you know, my column is really a chronicle of what goes on in the trade. And, and but I, I reflect this. It's been an interesting year. Uh, first of all, um, some of the things that I've absorbed, uh, observed, not absorbed, I've, I absorb a lot of stuff, but I observe a lot of stuff too, uh, th this past year, are, are, are concerning to me, and also, on the other hand, I'm, I'm happy to see them. First of all, I, I think it's been a year when Heritage Auctions is rapidly establishing its, itself as the premier auction house in the United States. Maybe not by monetary value, because so they've seen Chrissy sell that big high-end art. Right. But in terms of variety of product, record-setting prices, 
still offering a variety of things that you can't buy at the New York houses. I think Heritage is now king of the hill as far as auction houses in America are concerned. And I and I don't want to I don't want to negate, by the way, Heritage is important globally, because thanks to the internet, his buyers all over the world. But I think it's the age of Heritage, uh, and it's going to get it's going to get better. Now at the same time, some of the fun things too, and and you can reflect on this from what you're, the information you're getting in the Worthypedia, we're getting some very strong regional houses. Regional houses that were strong before, but have gotten stronger in the last year. The one that comes immediately to mind is Rago, down in Lambertville, New Jersey. Right? They're, they're, uh, we love getting their data. <laughs> right, and you should love getting their data because they, 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 they have a wide variety of quality of pieces in them, and, and they still have some in the middle middle market as opposed to just the high-end pieces. Okay, I mean, Dave will take some of the lesser stuff. Uh, another, another example is Pook and Pook in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. James Julia up in Maine, right? right. Um, trying to think of some of the other houses we might mention, the strong regional uh, uh, Cowan, houses. Cowan's in Cincinnati. Uh, which one? Cowan's, West Cowan. Oh, Cow no, he's at, Cowan's in Cleveland, isn't he? No, Cincinnati. I thought. No, that's Treadway. That's a Treadway and Toomey in Chicago. Did, did Cowens move down to Cincinnati? I always associated him with outside of Cleveland. Okay, I may be wrong, but I I always. But no, but but that's it. I thought he was Cincinnati, so um, I'll I'll have to check on that. But that's but that's an excellent that that's another another strong reach. The, the, the tragedy. Now you're you're yeah you can look it up a while. The tragedy, up you, you, no, no, we don't want to give out false information. Right. Yeah. The tragedy is that uh, all these strong auction houses, regional auction houses, are east of the Mississippi or on the Mississippi, like Selkirk's in, in St. Louis, although Garris is trying real hard to try to save Selkirk's, and I'm not sure how successful they're being. But we don't, but for some reason, the mountain states, the southwest, and even the west coast doesn't have, I, I mean, there, there are some uh, Biomes is in San Francisco and so forth. Biomes has never impacted. Ne I mean, okay, it does the TCM auctions. I give him credit for that. But, you know, it doesn't have the diversity and the skill set of, of, of the other ones. Right. Uh, right. But another another house we could have mentioned was Morphe's in Adamstown, Pennsylvania. Yeah, the it, advertising. It, 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 Morphe's is really expanding its product line. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's been an interesting era in the last couple of uh, of um, this past year to see these houses getting stronger. And I mean, significantly stronger. I mean, you can see it in their sales results. You can see it in the type of merchandise they're offering and the frequency with which they're offering it too. Did you find out where Cowan's is? Yeah, we're, we're both right. The, the main no, office. Oh, we can't both be right. I always have to be right. And they have a satellite office and sh uh, sales room in Cleveland. Well, all right, now wait a minute. Now, now you've hit upon another trend that's happened this year, which I haven't talked about, and in fact, I forgot to make a note of it, and that's the growth of satellite offices for auction houses. Hinman's got satellite auctions house. Skinner's has satellite auction houses. Uh, what I forget what auction house I was looking at recently that's just opened up some satellite offices. I mean, it's becoming well. Heritage certainly has, and yes. it's be, it's becoming. You know, and what happens is that these satellite houses are not there to do satellite auctions necessarily in their area, but to skim off the stuff and send it to the major auction house. So yeah, that's a very interesting development in this past year. You want to comment further, or are you going oh, to? Oh, well, yeah, no, I was going to say that the satellite offices just allows for um, a bigger reach. Uh, Cowens has representatives in Denver and Los Angeles as well. Right. So, so they can uh, search out items if they're going to have a big Americana sale. Um, so they've got the Mountain West and the West Coast covered too. Yeah, and, and that's how the West Coast and the Mountain area is being covered by the satellites from the, the, other, the other houses. Uh, in the not such good news area, I've been very concerned about the cancellation of antique shows around the country. The it's, big ones. Well, I had some... Some big ones, some of them have comebacks, others have not. 
many of them are canceling not because people won't come, because they can't find dealers. The dealer base is aging very badly, and the show and the dealers no longer will pay booth rents a year in advance. You know, yeah. well, you know, a show promoter, and I have a lot of, I know a lot of show promoters, and you know, again, I'm very blessed in this trade by having the ability to talk to all kinds of people in the trade. And I have to tell you that show promoters, it's a year-round business. But when they when they book a convention center, they have to put a deposit down. They have to pay insurance. They have to have a lot of upfront money. And if the dealers don't pay that, you know, down money on the booth rents, they don't have, and, and they have a lot of pre-show advertising. If the dealers don't put that down money down and pay up when the show starts, they're in economic trouble, serious economic trouble. And and the peer show went down because for that reason, a lot of shows and and the other and what concerns me is we don't have new young show promoters coming to the trade forget the fact we don't have new dealers that, that are working the show show and shop and mall and and flea market circuit we don't have promoters organizing them and creating them can and, uh, could it be that the business model is old yes that, yeah so something like uh, the randolph street market in chicago that has oh now now that's an exception but what makes that an exception? The promoter. You, yeah. In order for, uh, in order, for, and, and you know, the BAM, the Broadway Antique Mall at Chicago is another great example of a, of, a, of an antique mall that's just top of the line. But they're the promoter. The, all the credit goes to the promoters. But the problem with this is the following: it's not the market, it's not the merchandise, it's the promoter. And when that promoter retires, or that promoter loses interest, they can sell the show all they want. But the next owner can't keep them can't keep it up. It's a rare transition that that occurs, and that that has, you know, we're at a point now where a lot of the show promoters, the major show promoters, are aging out, and and even Sally Schwartz is not young anymore. I, I, I don't Sally's not listening to this show. Sally, you're as young forever as you are now. No, uh, but anyway. Uh, but no, I mean, I, 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 I love Sally Schwartz and she is a super great gal, but that market would be nothing without her. I mean, seriously. Right. And so, Sally runs the Randolph Street Market in Chicago. Yes, yeah, she does. Right. right. Exactly. Just like Chris Palmer out in the West Coast with Palmer Worth's operations. I mean, there is a case where it moved from the original owner to Chris and she did a great job. But who's going to succeed her? There's just nobody out there to do it. I mean, I, I, I got a sad note from... Uh, my friends at Old Stuff Mag is newspaper. It's a trade publication up out of Oregon, right? Yeah. They're at the point where they're going to shut their doors. They can't find a buyer. They can't find advertisers. They're going to just close their door probably early next year. And it's sad. It's sad to watch these things. But, but you're right about one thing. This is a market that changes. And, and certainly since the beginning of the 21st century, changes the order of the day. And we need to adjust. We need to find a way to adjust or we're going to be in big trouble. I mean, big, big trouble. But the other thing is, too, that that attendance at the markets, which was strong, actually, immediately following the 2008-2009 recession, and there was modest selling through, has fallen off this year. And what happens is that today, my friends tell me, you go to an antique flea market or show, and there's a good crowd for the first three hours. And then it dies. You know, I remember going to flea markets where there was a big crowd when it closed at night, you know, that was highly sustained. And it seems like everybody is done by noon. And that's disconcerting to, to me uh, a, a little bit. Uh, it, I don't want to be negative because I think there's a lot of new young collectors coming in the market and they're, they're collecting certainly things far different. I mean, look at modernism. I mean, you you know that. Look look at the look at the stuff that's on Worth Point, right in the price guide, or the yeah. worth of, the worth opedia. But but I mean, it's loaded with modern stuff with good prices on it. And in that yeah. market, and that market's global. The Italians and the others are buying it. You know, we we the American market is no longer an isolated market. It's part of a global marketplace. Now there are some things that only sell in the United States, and may even only sell regionally. But the point of them, and we talked about one of them last time, the Branninger Pottery, which was a you know Mid Atlantic State New England kind of product. Right, right. But the truth of the matter is that 
the high-end products, particularly miners' products, are global. And, and we're a great mother load for that stuff. And, and the Italian dealers and the European dealers are coming over here. Now, what is that going to change? The answer is yes. Why? Because we're doing too well economically. We got to get, we got to, you know, I, you know, I was hoping Hillary would be president so the market, the economy would collapse. And that way the dollar would <laughs> lose status against the euro and people would from Germany would come over here. Well, you know, when the dollar was, when the, when the euro was, uh, one euro was 140 and 150 to the dollar, you know, it was very cheap for Europeans to come over to the United States and buy. Now that the euro and dollar almost are at parity, right? It's expensive yeah, for them to come over here. And it's, and it's also semi-expensive for us to go over there uh, because all they do is raise their prices when they see us. No. Uh, but no, this is this is a big this is a big shift. Uh, I, I there there's a interesting firm in in England called Barnaby's. I think I talked to you about this once before that yeah, now issues monthly market updates and, and analysis of the market. And one of the things that they pointed out is that Chinese buyers are disappearing from the market. You know, I don't know, you know things are a little tougher in the economy over there, and and they were big buyers, especially in the high end markets. Yeah, yeah, they were they were gung ho, especially buying back. Um, oh, their own stuff. Like oh, I don't think items. I don't think that's going to end. Just like the Russians buying back the Russian stuff is going to end, but 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 they're no longer buying the Picasso paintings and that type of stuff. Okay, you know, as investments. Uh, the yeah the you know every every market in my in our business is a bubble. Seriously, I mean, people don't look at it like that. I, I'm guruing a lot tonight. We, we actually do want to look at some logic in a few minutes. But every market in our business is a bubble. It's only a matter of time before it bursts. It may be 20, 30 years, but it'll burst. It always bursts. If you look back at what people collected in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and I mean, I have some knowledge of that because I had my research center and I studied that. Nobody collects that stuff today. And in a lot of cases, the market is, I mean, the rule of thumb today in early American furniture is you can buy pieces today for 1970s prices. That's how far back the market's fallen on the whole, especially for the middle range stuff and the commons. The common stuff is even worse. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to kick myself that I that I didn't buy some Pennsylvania German furniture when I was younger. And now I'm saying to myself, man, it wasn't a dumb move because I could buy it today when I have actually have the money for the same price I could have bought it in the 70s. On the other hand, if I bought it in the seventies and hoped it would go up and support my retirement, I'd be eating it because it didn't make anything on the money. So, right. I, I, so it's interesting. Well, speaking of speaking of the past, we got a I got a fun uh, email in this this week from one of our uh, people inquiring about a, a celluloid Santa Claus, and and I sent you the images, right? Yep, I got it. Let's, let's got get it. the little let's get the little fellow up here. And the story, the story about this is the, the gentleman told me that uh, that when he was a, a young boy, he went in 1947, he went into a store and bought this nine inch celluloid Santa, which has a light in the back. Now, first of all, the fact that it survived this long is incredible. The second thing is that just as a word of warning, celluloid is flammable. So, you know, if you're going to turn that light on, you better not leave it on for 24 hours or, or Frosty the Snowman will, will, will go away. Well, as it turns out, as we started to do some research work on this, uh, uh, the first thing we did was check and see what the Orthopedia had to say, right? Right. So let's see what the Orthopedia had to say. Okay, so there are various versions of... Well, there are at um, least... There's at least two that we know about, right? Right. So we found um, this version. Right. And there he and is. This, I mean, that's the same guy. But it's he, the same guy, but he has a, in his left hand, he's got a socket for a light bulb. Yes. Okay? And when uh, we looked at the detail of the one that was sent to us, to us, there was no socket in the left hand, right? Right. So here, but, here we are. Oh, no, yeah, you're right. Yeah, there's no socket there that I can see, and you can't either, so. No. Uh, so there's, all right, but now let's go back to that logo. But, you know, up until this point, this guy was just a ordinary 
uh, you know, late 1940s uh, lighted snowman. But now, here, the person who has this says, vintage royal light, hard plastic Christmas, frosty the snowman, celluloid light. All right? Yes. So now we know that this was issued during the frosty craze, right? Yes. Well, if, if we can assume that he's correct on naming it. No, no, no. He's right. He's right about that, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, and, and, and now wait, are, is he right? Huh. I'll have to think about that. because Well, he doesn't have a corn cob pipe, but there's a hole in his mouth. He may have had one historically. Well, yeah, it looks like it could be um, a, a cigar butt or something. No, see this snowman didn't smoke cigars. <laughs> you sure? Yes, I am reasonably certain. But the <laughs> other, right. well, I don't know here. You know, we could spread rumors. But anyway, we notice the word royal light. So all right. of a sudden now, we can start to learn something about this. And and we found out. Now let's go to the next fellow you have there. All right. So the next one I found. Oh, how much for? Wait a minute. How much did he sell for? He sold for fifty-six dollars. Uh, fifty-six bucks. When? Fifty-six bucks uh, last Christmas. Yeah. And again, remember. WorthPoint is a, a a a database with years of information, so it pays to look at the date, right? Right. So, so uh, are there any other examples? I oh, found another one with the this light bulb. Got the light bulb in his hand to show yes. you how it's supposed to look. Uh, right. Now this one is called a um, made by Empire. Okay. All right, and he sold for forty-eight bucks, but that was ten years ago. All right, I, all right, but no, wait a minute, though. But we have another example, which yes. will solve the question of whether Royal Light or Empire made him or who made him. And there it is. Here is right. a Christmas Snowman General Corporation rare vintage cellulite lamp in box, but not claiming to be frosty. Right, right. right. Now let's, no, have a, let's have a look frosty. at his mouth. Uh, get a, we have a close up. Well, or blow up the box because we now know. Yeah, he that's need to have a pipe either. He's still smoking a cigar. Still got, he's still, still got the stubby stogie. Well, then he's not frosty. We, we'll do we'll do another check in a minute here. And he sold for twenty three bucks with the box, right? Yes. That's now, right. now, and, but we know he's. But we know now. It doesn't. Does it say whether the manufacturer on that list or not? This is the listing says. Um, it's Royal Electric Company under their generic name, General. All right. So they must, have made, they must have made some generic examples and sent them out to the big box stores at the time or however they did it yeah. or mail order catalogs or whatever they did. All right. All right. So meanwhile, back at the ranch, I did some work on the Royal Electric Company manufacturer of Royal Light. And they were the chief rival of Noma, N-O-M-A. Remember Noma lights? You must have tons of Noma lights up on here. Yes. My, my grandmother had uh, At several. the time, they were making bubble lights. Well, a devastating fire broke out at, at Royal Electric in 1955, which wiped out its factories and their Christmas products. Uh, residents of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where their families were located, were, were for months afterward parts of Christmas lighting props, products washed up on the shore of the Blackstone River. Well, anyway... In the end, <laughs> Noma bought out um, uh, um, Royal. Now, the question at hand now, which we have to do a quick research thing is, and I'll see if I can get that up on my computer is, okay, what is the date of Frosty the Snowman, right? Okay, I'll race you. No, oh, well, well oh, no, no, I, my fat, my fat stomach is blocking my keyboard, so. No, so, so, so Frosty with a Y and not an IE. Okay. Oh, no. No, no. Frosty the Stoneman is a popular Christmas song written by Walter Jack Rollins and, and was first recorded by Gene Autry and the Cass, Cass County Boys in 1950. 1950. Okay. So if this guy bought his snowman in bought, bought his snowman in 1947, it ain't Frosty. It's just a snowman, right? Yeah. So what price are we going to put on this guy's snowman? It's working order. Looks in pretty good shape. I like it at 25 bucks. 
Yeah, this one, this example. 25 to 30 at least. $23 three years ago. So Yeah, that's okay. I still think. But this one, this one also had the box. Hmm. Did it, when was it sold? Uh, October of 2013. Yeah, well, we're going to price it as always being sold in two days before Christmas. All right. No, okay. It's an imp uh, impulse purchase. You'll pay a little bit more for it. You will. Yeah, but still nice. And not just that, but good size, nine inches. Yes. So, okay. And obviously made for a number of years, but not Frosty. We will not attribute him to Frosty. All right, well, that's fine. That, that's okay. Well, I want to take another object right away because it's the time of the year. I got a, oh, yes, let's do this, this one. This is a fast 81. A good friend of mine up in Janesville, Wisconsin, uh, Ron Schuler, is, is a Christmas collector. He's very active in uh, the uh, Golden Glow of Christmas Past. That's the collector's club for Christmas stuff, right? Yeah. And he went, he went, he went to a uh, show and found this puzzle. Now, I don't want to, it's a block puzzle, but it's not a traditional block puzzle. It's a strip puzzle on wood. Strip puzzles is when they're when they're strips and you put them together and they make a scene. Well, yes. a block puzzle you normally think is a cubic, is a cube puzzle, you know, with images on 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 each of the six sides and it makes six pictures. This one is a strip puzzle, but on on wood blocks that are about eight and a half inches long by three quarter inches, and it makes four pictures. It makes these uh, the, the Christmas morning picture and the other Christmas picture, right? Right. But then it also has an ABC uh, set of blocks. And here, here they are, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, and then a, 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 another set of pictures for the balance of the alphabet. I don't, oh, yeah, there, there you go. They combined a few letters there to make it fit. Uh, and he, he, uh, he paid 95 bucks for, for it. The dealer was asking 100 and a quarter, and he got him 100 and a quarter, 100 and a quarter. But I think it was 100 and a quarter. He got him down 95 bucks. Now, it's a good thing. It's a good thing he bought it because if I'd have been there, I'd probably paid the hundred and a quarter just because it's so neat. But he wanted to know where it's from. Well, it's obviously not American. Those aren't American images. You know, if you could find a McLaughlin Brothers book or something, uh, if you could find a McLaughlin Brothers book or something, chances are uh, you won't find these images there. It's it's clearly Germanic in, in origin and dating probably between 1900 and 1915. And it's in great shape for what it is. I mean, super, super uh, uh, great shape. Now, he, he wrote he wrote and asked an important question, which is, and you can see it's got a little paper loss on some of the strips. If you go back up to that one young lady on the on the left, you'll yeah. see a little of her hair is missing, strip the papers torn off. He he asked me a question about the box. How critical is the box to the value of this puzzle? Well, if the box has either the Christmas morning or the Santa Claus image on the top, it's very critical because the box alone is worth the price of the puzzle on the interior. But I think 95 bucks was a bargain, and I like it at 100 and a half to 200 without the box, and with the box about 350 to 375. But it it is a wonderful piece. Which, by the way, by the way. Colonial Williamsburg, the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Folk Art Museum at Colonial Williamsburg. Do you know about that? Yes. Yes. Has a new exhibit, uh, German toys from the early 19th century. Really? Yes. And and you wonder what toys have to do with folk art, but that doesn't mean there is Mrs. Rockefeller like toys, and so they have toys. But they found an 1840 German toy catalog, wooden toys, German wooden toys, in the 19th century, they found an 1840 catalog and were able to find dozens of toys in, in their collection that matched the pictures, images of the catalog. And wow. Yes. And in fact, if you just, for sheer delight, if, 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 if you want, if you go to colonialwilliamsburg.com, okay? Okay. All right. Yeah, you can do that, actually. We can do that. Go to colonialwilliamsburg.com. Get Frosty the Stoneman there. Got it? You know, I like this interactive thing because it's fun to do this type of stuff with it. All right. Get colonialwilliamsburg.com. Click on that okay. there. Here it comes. Coming up here. All right. Now, on the, on the thing, go to uh, not, not each shop. 
I'll go to go to play. Now over to play, P L A Y. Then go over to art museums. No, no, go go to that's it. Click on the art museum one there, right? And then scroll down. Look at that. And there is uh, a wonderful thing on that, and and they have a little video. And click on the video. All right, we're gonna play it some. Well, you know, no, I mean, isn't it wonderful? I, a lot of these, cool. to a lot of these toys come from the Erzgebirge region of Germany, out of Siphon with the big crystal sparkers at Nuremberg and and uh, Dresden. And I've been to all these places, as you know. I visit Siphon from time to time. I actually have uh, uh, several of these type objects in my collections. Maybe not as old as these, but I mean, there's a there's a big Noah's Ark. They have a huge Noah's Ark, but but what a wonderful what a wonderful exhibit. So, you know, if 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 you your travels wind up taking you down to Colonial, oh look at that, wow. There, if your if your travels take take you down to oh John Gilly, I had her by we should get her on on the show one time. I had her on my What You Got radio show this past weekend, and and she was just a total delight to to, to talk to. Her. All right, well you can kill that. All right. Well, but I've been to all these places where these are made, and 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 they are fun. And I, in fact, I'm looking across the room at several uh, modern uh, Erzgebirge figures, uh, soldier figures, and so forth. So you know, there's an exhibit. Should you be traveling in William, uh, toward in uh, the, the uh, Norfolk Peninsula, uh, over there in Virginia, and you have a chance to stop at Williamsburg, uh, you you don't have to go to all the buildings necessarily, but stop by the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Museum and catch up with this exhibit. Okay, and we'll end on a on a, on a weird note. Uh, I uh, this week uh, they came by and picked up my stuff that's going to be in a special exhibit at the Grand Rapids Art Museum called Finders Keepers: West Michigan Collects. And, and are you ready for this? When does that open? It opens on February the fifth, and it runs until April twentieth. And that nineteen. There are 19 people exhibiting stuff from their collections, including the Public Museum and the Art Museum and other people. Only one person has more than one collection exhibited. And who would that be, Harry? <laughs> and that's, and, and they only took five of my collections, and it really leaks me off because I went into do the whole exhibit about me, but they wouldn't do that. Now, you'll get your own exhibit soon. Some, someday soon, you'll get one. Listen. Why do you think I bought all that stuff that I owned? Look at my price guides. My price guides are my collections, in a lot of cases anyway. Well, here we are. Look at this. It went went fast again tonight. It did. Before we go though, let's uh, let's let people see how to send it. Oh, you mean we would actually like people to communicate with us? Yeah. Well, anyway, if you'd like to submit an item for us to talk about on the show, and we would like you to do it. Come on, gang. Uh, send us information about your object be as as much descriptive as you can how did you acquire its size markings all the rest of that picture is the biggest help of all community at worthpoint.com community at worthpoint.com also do you have something you'd like us to talk about in the trade you know pontificate about or whatever same same email works right community that's right at worthpoint.com now you know we're not quite ready to celebrate a year's worth of these Worth Point Chats with Harry Rinker. Do you know how close we are? Uh, we're pretty close. I think we started in late February, February or... February 22nd was the first one we did. January 22nd? No, wait, February 22nd was the first one we could post on YouTube. We ah, were, right. Okay. Yes, we had, a, we had a few experimental versions that, that, that have been lost to posterity, thank goodness. <laughs> we did our best. We, did, we, are, <laughs> we still do our best, you know. Hey, for two guys sitting in front of a computer, we cover a lot of ground. Anyway, right. my friend, have a happy holiday season. Be safe, be well, enjoy your family, enjoy your friends, and we'll talk the first Wednesday of the new year. That's right, Harry. You have a, a Merry Christmas, and we'll be back, uh, I think, January 4th is uh, the first Wednesday. All right, until uh, next year, we will uh, say goodnight. Good night, Harry. Good night.